calling a call to arms and I want us to uh, work on this together I never was in the United States Armed Services uh, but I've always been fascinated with our armed services uh, the style uh, the dress the order the, the, the manner I've always been fascinated with the military, uh, even uh, military leaders of the past, uh, military geniuses like Alexander the Great and Hannibal, all those guys. Uh, I was in high school and I turned 18 and, and, and during that time you had to register for the draft because we were involved in the Vietnam conflict, and so I had to register. So I did. I wasn't going to run or do it. I wasn't going to avoid military service, but uh, I had a plan. And uh, if I had gotten a letter from Uncle Sam to join the Army, I was going to tell my mother now, when they come to the house looking for me, probably with handcuffs that you just tell them my son is not here. He joined the Air Force. <laughs> if I had gotten drafted, I was going straight and joined the Air Force. Uh, but, the, but the military world is a fascinating place. And uh, the style, the, the, the whole procedure to me is a very fascinating thing. And as, as, as the world has advanced and become more dangerous, it was Albert Einstein and his theory of relativity that gave birth to the creation of the atomic bomb. And you know, we talk about weapons of mass destruction. Our nation is the only nation on earth to have ever used a nuclear device in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now you can argue how many lives might have been saved and how the war was shortened, but we still have been the only nation to drop a, a nuclear weapon, an atomic bomb, and devastated uh, portions of the island of Japan. But as the nation, but as other nations began to develop these weapons, the whole world became more dangerous. And if anyone here is anywhere around my age, although I was a child, but if you can remember that in the 1960s, in the administration of President John F. Kennedy, when we found out that the Russians had placed missiles in Cuba and when the president found this out uh, he had he was faced with some very serious choices some of some of his staff suggested that we invade Cuba well you must remember those weapons were put there by Russia and that time was the very height of what was called the Cold War and uh, Mr. Kennedy knew that if he invaded uh, Cuba what would happen and something said, some of his staff said, well, Mr. President, they won't do anything. He said, you mean to tell me I invade the island of Cuba where there were Russians working on those weapons and, and Russians are killed and Nikita Khrushchev will do nothing? At that time, the hot spot in the world was Berlin. And he expected that Russia would move on Berlin. Bottom line is, many expected in the military and political community that we very well might, well might come to nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Well, the president did not uh, invade, but he liked the idea of a quarantine. And he put a quarantine around Cuba, and as history records, the president uh, stood his ground. Mr. Khrushchev blinked and there was no conflict. What was not told was that we had put missiles in Turkey aimed at Russia. And what was kept secret in the agreement was we would remove our weapons from Turkey in, in exchange for moving the weapons out of Cuba. But that's the closest we have come 
to a nuclear conflict. And if we had invaded Cuba, very likely it would have happened. And they had missiles in Cuba ready to strike cities in the United States. So then there's a code now that the government has, the military has. It's called DEFCON, D-E-F-C-O-N. It means, uh, it means defense. Uh, a construction or defense uh, circumstances, DEFCON, and there's five of them. And we, right now, and if anybody here is in the military, if I'm wrong, don't mind correcting me. Right now, I'm sure we're at DEFCON 5. That means the lowest state of readiness. There is no uh, defense confrontation is what I was trying to say. Uh, there, is no, there is no threat, major threat of, of a nuclear conflict, but there's still a state of readiness. The president walks around with a, somebody follows him with a black briefcase. It's called the nuclear football. And in that briefcase are codes always at his side to launch a nuclear attack if he came find out our nation was under attack. It's always there. It's scary, isn't it? Uh, and this, uh, this nuclear football, and, I, I'm, and I'm told that there are submarines all over the world who stay underwater, who have nuclear weapons on them ready to be fired at any time, as well as silos and missiles and all that kind of thing. So we're at a low state of readiness right now. We're DEFCON 5. Then there's DEFCON 4. That means increased intelligence and watch strengthens the security measures. In other words, that's when someone says, hey, there's some stuff out there, some things going on, we need to be a little more vigilant. That's DEFCON 3. That's an increase in force readiness above required readiness. That's when we're saying, look, this thing is serious, there's something going on. Then there's DEFCON 2 which means the next step is nuclear war. And there's DEFCON 1. That means nuclear war is imminent. We're about to go to war. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this is what happens in the military, in the government uh, of our nation in terms of keeping us secure. But I want to submit to you tonight that I have a feeling that the, the devil is at DEFCON 1 and the church is at DEFCON 5. The devil is launching missiles at the church like crazy. And the church is, say, really? Wow. The church seems to be thinking that this is not a war we're in. That, that the old ship of Zion is a love boat and not a battleship. That we're called to a banquet and not a battlefield. And all the signs are everywhere. The world is going to hell in a handbasket and America is becoming a pagan nation. And I'm waiting for the church to respond and the church isn't saying a word. Should we read our Bibles more? Oh, don't worry about it. Should we do more praying? Well, I mean, if you want to. Should we be marshalling our forces to face the conflict? What conflict, Pastor? You're always so emotional. Bishop, you're always so uptight. Bishop, chill. Should we be doing more in the spiritual area? For what? All is well. That's the attitude. I don't just mean life center. I mean of the church world. The, the church world is in danger of what the book of Amos says, woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. Now the world is coming at us with ships and planes and drones and weapons and we haven't launched a missile at the devil in years. And he's taken our homes. He's taken our children. He's filling the jails. He's destroying our schools. He's destroying our government. And the church has seemingly lost all of its desire to engage in the battle. I said this this morning, but something came to me that maybe the problem is that those of us who are in charge with the Oval Office are not passing on the message. 
I'm sure the commander-in-chief is called DEFCON 1, but somehow between the co commander-in-chief and the forces, the word is not getting through. You know, the, the president does have the joint chief of staff. And whatever he says, they carry it out. So I don't think it's the Lord. I think some of his generals, some of his uh, officials over the troops are not passing down the word because I do believe. So I want to deal with this call to arms, and I want to help us as a church, first of all, understand the nature of this battle and, and the ramifications of it. Now, I hate this phrase. I'm going to use it tonight, but I hate it because it makes no sense to me. I'm, I'm going to give some intricate information, but <laughs> I hate this phrase when the preacher says, I'm going somewhere. Well, good God, I hope you are. <laughs> I would hate to get on an airplane and the pilot say, I'm going somewhere. That's why I got on the plane. But, I'm, but, but what I want you to know is that what I'm, 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 whatever I tell you, just wait for something else to come because all of this is on the way to something else. Now, let me explain the matter of the spiritual battle. Now, you've heard a lot about spiritual warfare, but let's see what the Bible says about this whole matter of spiritual warfare. And it might not be as exciting because it doesn't mean how loud you pray, how you buck your eyes, or how you have some kind of emotional experience. But let's see what the Bible says. Now, the first thing I need to say to the body of Christ is we must understand our posture. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to understand our posture. I'm going to end up in Ephesians 6, but let's start there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now listen, our posture as believers, now listen carefully, this is very important, is a position of victory. Jesus Christ arose from the dead and has given to the church victory. Jesus Christ paid the penalty of sin, went into the grave, took the sting out of death, the victory out of the grave. He spoiled principalities, made a show of them openly, led captivity captive, and he is victor. And he, God, through Jesus Christ, has given us the victory. You've got to understand that. Listen, the church, listen to me carefully, cannot be ultimately defeated. It can't happen. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. But I use the word there. I said ultimately. The church cannot be destroyed or defeated. I'm going to use that word the theologians like eschatologically. Don't let that throw you. The eschaton simply means judgment or end time. So in the real sense, the church of Jesus Christ will survive, will prevail, and cannot be ultimately defeated but here is the oxymoronic conundrum of the churches that many of us will end up victorious in the end and defeated along the way in other words in the end we're going to be alright we're going to come out on top there's no condemnation but along the way the devil is going to defeat us and make us weak and ineffective and anemic and defeated when we ought to watch this. The, the coming eschatological victory that's future ought to be realized in our present situation. So let me tell you something. I don't care. I don't, I don't mean it like that. I, no, I don't mean to say that. I'm not worried about heaven and the kingdom of God. Baby, when I get that, it's all settled. Ain't no dying there. Ain't no demons there. There's no trouble there. Uh, the, 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 there'll be no death and no hell and no sickness. I don't need victory over there. I need victory right now. I mean, I mean, I know one day God's going to wipe away all tears from my eyes and one day there'll be no more death and sorrow. But what about right now? I need some victory right now. I need to see God do some stuff right now. I need power right now to face this enemy and come out with the victory. I'm not satisfied to win by and by. I want to win some right now. And you cannot tell me that our present situation is not important. If it were not important, then watch this, then why didn't the Lord just save you and take you to heaven? If your work here was not important, then we don't need to be here. But victory belongs to the believer. Say that back to me. Look at, look at verse 57. But thanks be unto God, verse 57, who giveth us the what? The what? I can't hear you. 
the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. I need power now to see God at work. I need to see the devil defeated right now. I need to see demons cast out, bodies healed, souls saved, and the work of God. And listen, I am not of that school that likes to whine and complain and moan and be sad about the church. Let me help you change your mind about the church. Do not let, do not let the devil, do not let critics, do not let people make you talk negatively about the church. And if you do it, don't do it around me. Don't, uh, the church is... is it's a mess and, and it's, it's full of hypocrites and I had a better time in the world. Okay, then go on back. If you were happy with the devil and if the people in the bars are business, then go on back. Don't sit here complaining. Don't sit here whining. I'm glad to be in the church. I love the church of God. I'm blessed in the church. Everybody in the church is not mean to me. Everybody in the church is not a hypocrite. Everybody in the church is not immoral. There are some people in the church that love the Lord and trying to do right. And if everybody you run into is wrong and bad, you're traveling in the wrong company. Do you mean to tell me nobody in this church is nice? Everybody in the church is dogging you out. Everybody is backstabbing you. The devil is a liar. That's an effort of the devil to make us think, oh, when it comes to the church, it's time to complain. Lord, how is the church doing? What kind of question is that? Now, if you want to ask a question about a building, separate that from the church. You don't want to hear me teach tonight. If you want to ask what state am I in mentally, don't confuse that with the church. I might be crazy, but the church is all right. We might have some crooks in here, but the church is all right. There might be some phonies and liars, but there have always been phonies and liars. There's always been Simon the sorcerer and Judas Iscariot. There's always been Alexander the coppersmith and Demas hath forsaken me. That ain't nothing new, but the church is all right. Lord, how is the church? What do you mean how is the church? We're the body of Christ. And victory is in us if we understand it and change our thinking. I love that church, oh God. This is a, see here's the problem. The problem is we don't understand. It took, it's bothering me that it took me 51 years of preaching and 33 years of a pastor to understand where I've been going wrong. See, watch this. I've been barking orders at people for 33 years and telling them to do things and they didn't know they was in the army. I didn't, I thought, I thought everybody knew that they were soldiers in the army. See, when you're a soldier, you start off on your left foot because they said so. You say, 13, you say 1,300 hours because they say so. Watch this. You show up on time and in your place because they say so. Look how y'all looking at me. See, when you're in the military, if I say, Clint, see, if, if, I, if I'm a general and I walk in the room, it doesn't matter whether you like me or not. He better get on his feet. Oh, y'all hear what I'm saying? See, hey, it doesn't, he, I, I don't like him. And watch this. He ain't my daddy. I ain't your daddy, but I am your general. And I've been commanding folks, and I couldn't figure out why they look at me like that. I ain't doing that. I don't want to do that. I don't do this. I don't do that. That ain't military talk. You see how y'all looking at me? I've got a bunch of soldiers who all decided they'll take only the commands they like. And the ones they don't, don't mess with me. And if you push me too much, I'll change bases. I'll go to another military base. Teach, Pastor. You salute officers in, in the military. You walk like they say walk. You be with them. There's no question. I don't know what we got. Uh, okay. Fall out at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock. Hey, you must be crazy. I wish I would. See, there's no question. And the Lord told me to go to New Orleans and get a group of soldiers together because he wanted to put an outpost in New Orleans from which he could attack the enemy and establish his outpost. And I'm having trouble because my soldiers got a funny attitude. 
I tell my soldiers, I want y'all to walk in the line like this. What are we doing this for? I, I want y'all to walk this way. Would you walk this way? <laughs> here we go again. I need the soldiers here at a certain time. No, Bishop, that's okay. I just don't want to be a soldier no more. Go on by yourself. How many generals, there's a young, uh, one day a mother was listening to her children in the room, and she came in, they were sitting at the desk, and they were being very intellectual, and she said, what are y'all doing? She says, Mama, we're playing war. And they said, well, they said, yes, we all generals. <laughs> I wonder what I could do if I could get 50, 60, 70, 80 soldiers that said, come hell or high water, we got your back, Bishop. Bishop, take that wall, we'll take it with you. No, 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 no. I don't need the whole church. I don't need all the lead men of life. But if I could get 50 or 60 committed, wouldn't bend, wouldn't break, get on the front line, how many neighborhoods could I change? But I got 10 this week. I got three the next week. I got four the next week. And after 20, I'm still asking, brother, can I get you online? No, I, I, that ain't, no, I'm just trying to make a point. And I'm trying to take this wall right here. And I look back and sometimes I got 10 men, sometimes I got four, sometimes I don't have any. And I just say, okay, I'll take the wall next week. But I'm wondering when can I take that wall. But I can't take the wall with soldiers who haven't decided when they're going to be in the battle. I need soldiers in the battle every time I go to war. I'm sorry, y'all, I, I shouldn't be teaching like this. I, I'm sorry, y'all, I shouldn't teach like this. I got to see, I'm the kind of soldier, I show up every time the battle cry goes. Every time the court, if I'm not in church on Sunday, I'm preaching somewhere. I don't sit at home on Sunday. I don't go to other places on Sunday. I don't care who's playing. I don't care who's singing. I don't care who's dancing. If it's Sunday, I got to be on my post. Because I'm under orders. When 4.30 comes on Sunday morning, I get out the bed because I hear God say, Yes, sir. I don't think I'm going on my post today. Really, I was watching TV one day, and it was a, it was a ship. The admiral was on the ship. I never forget this. I remember like it was yesterday. And this, what do you call that gun that's on the edge of the ship? Huh? The gunner? He, he was, he was, the admiral was standing, he was talking to somebody. And about, about 60 feet away, he saw a torpedo, watch this, that had been fired from a submarine. And the admiral didn't flinch. He looked at the gunner and said, gunner, Found that torpedo and blew it up. I've been having nightmares ever since I saw that. Because I can see me looking at my gunner saying, first of all, where is my gunner? <laughs> Secondly, watch this. Found that torpedo. You talking to me? I'm grown like you. I got other things to do besides find that torpedo. <laughs> you so emotional, Bishop. You so, boom, the ship blows up. Folks, I'm trying to tell you, but here's the problem I'm having with all of this. But the devil is serious. His soldiers and his troops, human and demonic, never miss a step. They're never off base. We have to understand that. But the beauty of it is we operate from a position of victory. The devil has been defeated. Now, the battle rages, but the devil has been defeated. Our job is to seal that defeat and watch this and to, listen to me carefully, and to remind him every time he raises his head that we are the victorious army of the Lord and he's been defeated. The disciples said, oh, Jesus, you should have seen what happened. He said, calm down, fellas. I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. He doesn't intimidate me. The devil doesn't frighten me. I told you about that experience I had. See, if you understand why your pastor's like he is, it's because my spiritual life ain't no joke. Over 30 years ago, I had a face-to-face -face -face confrontation with Satan. So I can't play with this. You play with it. I can't play with it. I know what he's like. I have been in a face-to-face -face confrontation with the spirit that told me my name is Lucifer. And I saw his face come up out of the face of a girl that I was casting the devil out of. So you play with it. You stay home. You do what you got to do. But I, I have tasted the other side of this. I can't play with because I know this is, as they say in the street, this is your business. 
And when you, I have seen the Lord and I've seen the devil. So I can't play with this. It's too deep. It's too serious. I know how ugly it is and I know what it's all about. So the whole issue here, and I, I see things like I do because I have seen into the spiritual world. And I understand. It involves a level of thinking and behavior because this battle is critical and conclusive and that the Lord never intended for the church just to be successful in the eschaton. But right now, there are battles we should be winning. And demons we should be defeating. So, so I'm calling the church tonight to Death Con 1. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Now let me, let, me, let, me, let me get this to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I want you to look at verse 13. So just go from chapter 15 to chapter 16. Then I want to go to Ephesians and then we're going to wrap up for tonight. Look at verse uh, 13. I want, you to, I want you to mark the verbs here because this is what happens when you go to Death Con 4. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. But this is from the New American Standard. So look at the verbs in there. Alert. Firm. Like men. Be strong. That's what it's going to take. Y'all... We're going to have to, first of all, we're going to have to wake up and realize this is serious. When you're alert, eyes are open, minds are sharp. We're going to have to stand firm in what we believe because let me tell you, the enemy is seeking to undercut everything we believe. When you have whole churches now, say it's all right to ordain uh, gays. I, I preached in a church just uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned the LGBT community, and a young lady walked up to me, and it was the weirdest conversation I've ever had. She thanked me for the message, and she told me to pray for her. Uh, she had to preach that Sunday, and she looked me right in my face, and she said, and by the way, when you stop being heterosexual, I'll stop being homosexual. Be on the alert. The devil is slowly cutting our Ground from under us. I, I helped consecrate a young lady back here some time ago who married a woman. I'm telling you, he's taken away the dirt from under us. And I'm just, somebody's got to notice, this is serious. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Now, now. Go to Ephesians. This is where we're going to camp out. This was, this was my preamble. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. This is the, and by the way, you should read the six chapters that make up the book of Ephesians because this, six, this, this is the ultimate letter on the church. This, this is a marvelous letter. It's a magnificent book. It's three parts. The first three chapters deal with the doctrine of what we have and who we are in Christ. And the, the, the next three chapters deal with the practical outworking of the life of us in the church. Now look at verse 10 of chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. After Paul has dealt with all of this, he's going to close out the book and he says, Therefore, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'll go back to verse 10. Finally, as I close, he was saying, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Stop right there. That's very important. Now let me tell you how we have victory that that's, we, we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. Let me tell you how we have it. Listen to this. Be strong. That's a command, by the way. Be strong. Here's what it means. Be strengthened in Christ himself. Find your strength in God's mighty power. All the resources we need are found in Christ and his mighty power. Listen to me carefully. That's important. Let me tell you how, one, not to get defeated in the Christian life and how not to get burned out. I'm warning you. Warning, warning. This Christian life will wear you out if you don't know where your strength comes from. Don't get mad with me. Don't get mad with the church. Don't get mad with the, 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 no, 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 no. The only way that your power as a believer runs out is if you're drawing it from the wrong source. New life in Jesus.